days ago I had one of those oh god I gotta do something comments um, it said would you please cover the matrix not just by title of the movie but of philosophy and idea I know you've covered a holographic simulator nature and reality in one of your books, perhaps in the 80s or so, but in this day and age, the topic is much in demand, and we would all find your shared insights enlightening. Well, that was interesting to me because I hadn't realised that um, the Matrix was back in demand and being talked about. Obviously, I knew about the movie. Now, I realised to do this properly, actually, I would have to... Uh, research a bit about what was being said about the Matrix now and what the issues were. And so this is going to take a bit of time. But what I could do straight away is to talk about the way the idea of the virtual reality universe evolved. A bit of it, go back to its history and how it came to me. So that's what I'm going to do and I'll probably do it in more than one, a series of several talks because there are several aspects to it. Going back to the beginning for me, when I was at school in Clifton College, we had a sort of six form, you know, discussion, debate society for a set group of people called the, I think it was called the Eggheads or the Arab Oppergites or something. And um, the master running it uh, invited a man called Frank Honeywell George to come and talk to us. Now, this must have been just about very early 60s, like 61 or 62, because Frank George wrote a book called The Brain as Computer. And that was his argument that um, the brain, uh, future computers could simulate a human brain. Now, he made it absolutely clear at the beginning of his talk that evening that um, when he's talking about computers, they may not be the great big massive machines that are around in those days with valves and that sort of thing. They might evolve in quite a different form. And in fact, he said potentially a computer of the future might be something more like a brain's, um, you know, with biological sort of thing. So basically, he said, don't be, don't be limited by the thought of computers as we now know them in 1960. But he said he reckoned that. Um, future computers could do everything that a human brain could do, they could actually simulate a human brain. Now that sort of discussion group, most of the people there were people studying English and history and that, you know, sort of the arts um, and some scientists, and um, they immediately felt very threatened by this sort of, it seemed to put down their creativity, their human, you know, poetry and things they write. And so the discussion continued like this. But surely a, a, poem, a, a computer could never write a poem, could it? Or um, could never fall in love, whatever, whatever, whatever. They were defending their creativity from this idea of a computer brain. Now, as a mathematician, I wasn't particularly interested in that. Um, because what I saw was that actually George wasn't um, just arguing for machine intelligence, he was demonstrating it. Consciously or not, he was using an algorithm to win this argument. And this was the algorithm. I say compute, a computer could do anything a human brain could. You say no, I sh don't think it could do, and you name a human activity. He says, okay, please could you describe that human behavior absolutely accurately. Now, if you can describe it absolutely accurately, then you simply told him what to program into the computer. If you can't describe it absolutely accurately, he says it's meaningless. In the first case, um, he's won because you've told him what to put into the computer. In the second case, he hasn't lost, but you haven't won because he just says what you're talking about is meaningless. So people are saying things like, um, well, uh, falling in love, you know, um, well, 
you follow the person around and all that. He says, yeah, I can program a robot to do that. Um, uh, 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 and when, when the person, when you speak to the person, they, they sort of get all stumbling about. He says, yeah, I can, can um, program to do that. You see, he was saying, unless you could describe it exactly in words, in which case I can program it in, then it's meaningless. Now, I wasn't particularly interested in that argument because actually what was more interesting to me, my key thing at the time was, is he making the world more boring than it already is or is he not? And I decided he wasn't. He was actually making something rather exciting about this world. And um, the thing that occurred to me then and immediately afterwards when I thought it over, was about reincarnation. You see, um, in our worldview of 1960, reincarnation was laughable. We knew that human being, me, is made up of a hell of a lot of stuff. You know, our DNA, a ton of information, my memories, my thoughts, my feelings, and so on and so forth. And the idea that all this stuff could somehow be transported through space and time to some future other body was ridiculous. There just wasn't any physical mechanism that could make that happen. Now, what I gathered from Professor George is that if all of that that is me could be recreated as data in a computer, What's to stop it being recreated in another human brain at some time in the future? Now, of course, the immediate answer to that is <laughs> we're talking of something so complicated that the chance that it could, the same pattern exactly could occur in another brain is so small that the universe would never live long enough to reproduce it. But my answer to that is that but I'm not an exact quantity. My personality, I'm a different person. This is from my own observation. Uh, first thing in the morning when I get up, I'm a different person than I'm that goes to bed at night. I hated it if I had to stay up the night, you know, and then from my nighttime self meeting my morning self. Some people like I, I hate that experience. Um, f five years ago, I was younger, but I was still the same person. So. The thing that is me is not an exact quantity. And the other thing is that at night I have dreams. And in my dreams I meet a lot of different people and I talk to them and I believe, in my dream I believe they're real people. In other words, my brain over the years has created an absolutely unlimited number of other human beings that actually answer the um, naive uh, Turing test. In other words, I speak to them and I don't know that they're not real human beings. So in my brain there's a capacity for carrying an enormous number of different characters. So the chance that one of the characters being generated in my brain might be a close approximation to Ramesses II uh, begins to be bit more believable. But the main thing is that what um, George was saying means that it could happen, whereas the physics version was it couldn't possibly happen. There's no way it could be transmitted. And so, you see, I, I felt this <laughs> rather exciting, you know. I, I was seeing that what looked like a real downer, you know, something that would make the world really boring, our brains are just computers, was actually opening up interesting possibilities. Now, over the course of the 60s, it went further than that for me. Um, and it's only in later years I've really found the words to describe what I was thinking. Um, you see, the big thing about making the word boring is this idea of reductionism. You know, um, I know what love is. It's the most amazing thing. I was an absolute sucker for love. I was a r romantic. I've fallen in love a million times and break my heart. I knew what love was. And then the physicist says, 
Well, actually, it's just sort of chemical hormones and electrical impulse in the brain. I don't know exactly what the explanation is, but it's something like that. You know, it's just the stuff in the other in the brain. Um, now that, you see, is a downer. It makes this huge cosmic experience reduced to just a few chemicals rattling around in the brain. That is reductionism. It's making the world boring. Um, now, uh, in later years, I realised two things. One was um, this description of love actually put the kibosh on George's dismissal of it as meaningless. Because if you may not be able to describe it in words, but if a physicist could say, yes, it is these chemicals, these hormones in the brain, you can't say it's meaningless because it's been identified scientifically. To sort of explain what it is, you see, it's given it like a passport to reality. However humbling that description of being in love with um, is, it's given it, the scientific description has given it a passport to reality. Now to explain that, you as a person are something infinitely complex and wonderful. There you are as a real person in your real life. And your friends and your family know you like that. But if one day a policeman stops you and says, where were you on the night of the 31st? Blah, 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 um, he will demand to see your ID card or your passport or something. It's called a passport to show who you really are. Now that's what, when a um, scientist describes love in terms of whatever chemical or electrochemical reactions or whatever, um, he's giving you that passport to reality, whereas you know what love really is as an experience. So um, uh, this sort of re scientific reductionism, although it was pretty humbling and levelling, it was denying um, George's thing that it was meaningless because it was giving it that passport to reality. It really is something, even if it only is a few chemicals buzzing around. That was the one thing. The second thing was this, that in later years, I describe it like this, I found that reductionism had a reverse gear. You see, go back to the 60s, love and peace and happiness and all that. In the 60s, I like to think that a flower turns towards the sun and opens because it loves the sun. And the scientists will say, no, 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 no. It's about the photochemical effect on the stem. Um, it grows slower than the bit that's in the sunlight and uh, therefore it turns around or something. It's just, just again, you see, it's just a sort of um, chemical, electronic, electric chemical reaction or whatever. Now, I would say, I know what love is because I feel it, I've experienced it. And you tell me that it is an electrochemical reaction. And you tell me that the flower turns the sun because of an electrochemical reaction. Well, why can't I call that love? I mean, they're both electrochemical reactions. Um, if you look at the DNA of that plant and of me, I can't remember what the figure is, it's something like 50% you know, the same or something like that. You know, we've got a hell of a lot in common as living things. So it's not proving that it really is love, but it's up to you to explain why two organisms with such, um, so much in common in terms of their basic structure, their DNA, why it is that one can experience love and you insist that the other cannot when they're both just uh, chemical reactions. You see where I'm going from. Um, I'm hurrying this over a bit, but basically this is like putting uh, the reduction into reverse gear as far as I was concerned. Um, suddenly all sorts of things that one wasn't allowed to say, like flowers turning towards the sun because they love them, or, um, you know, that, see, in terms of these chemical reactions, love is all around us. You know, every single plant is experiencing these things. So can't we just say the whole universe is a vibrating ocean of love? I love it. <laughs> hey, thank you, science. Thank you, reductionism. 
you've made my world come to life again. And so that was um, sort of what first put these ideas into my brain. It was the idea of machine intelligence, as we called it then, artificial intelligence. How, on the one hand, it seemed to be sort of squeezing the essence, the love and the life out of life and making it very boring. But if you sort of found that reverse gear, it actually was saying something rather amazing. The world is beginning to look a lot more interesting than even the scientists would allow it to be. Now, um, I haven't yet got onto the virtual reality bit. It stems from that because you see what George, how Frank George was describing was a computer. Okay, it might not be made of valves and things, you know, or now, of course, it's chips. Uh, or even it might be some biological thing. But anyway, there's this box, and in it is my mind. Now, does that make it me? And it was obvious even then that it doesn't, because I am a person with limbs in a 3D space, and I've got senses and all that. And unless you gave that box limbs and senses and all that type of thing, it wouldn't be me because it's just stuck. It might be think like me, it might have the dreams of me, but it wouldn't be me. But what if you could not only program that mind into there, but you could program this room into it in great detail so that that mind in there could reach out and touch this screen. It could touch this keyboard. It could walk around. Now that's more like it. That is the concept of what is now called a virtual reality. And I would call it then, I think, a, a sort of a model of the world. Um, now, that would require a huge amount of extra programming. I mean, it's a big, huge business anyway, putting the mind in there. But uh, you see, because um, I should be able to walk around this room with a microscope, with a magnifying glass, looking very closely at everything. Uh, if there's a light switch on the wall, I should press it and the light should come on. Otherwise, you haven't modelled it right. So there's a lot of stuff in there. And so it all began to look too complicated. I couldn't see all that being done. And so I rather sort of forgot about it until... And this is what the next video will be about. Until I had a new idea which suddenly opened up the field of what one could do with computer modelling. And I think I'm going to put that into the next video and I'm going to stop now.